Good morning. Grace and peace to all of you. Isaac, it is so awesome to see you here today. I was worried, you know, I felt all this pressure. So I feel much better having you here this morning. So I see you got your Packers jersey on, so you're ready to go. You're looking good. You're styling. Great. Well, I want to welcome you all to worship, whether you're here in person or whether you're worshiping with us remotely. It is wonderful to have you a part of our Christian family here at Zion on this first Sunday of Christmas. And I hope that you all had a wonderful Christmas Eve and Christmas Day uh, with your family. And uh, as we get ready for worship today, our focus text is going to be on the gospel. And the question that I was wrestling with was why were Simeon and Anna able to recognize Jesus for who he is when so many other people would have been in the temple and they completely missed it? And so we know that Jesus comes to us anew each and every day. So how can we recognize him daily in our midst? And so we're going to take a closer look at that this morning. As we prepare for worship, though, I invite you to join with me in our confession and forgiveness, which is printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who was in the beginning, who makes a dwelling among us, who covers us with justice and mercy. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another this morning. God of goodness and loving kindness, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. We have turned away from your invitation to new life. We have turned away from the lowly and the downtrodden in your abundant mercy. Forgive us our sins, those we know and those known only to you. For the sake of the one who came to live among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. And now hear these words of God's grace and love for us this morning. Hear the good news of peace and salvation. God forgives you all, uh, forgives us all our sins, not through our own work, but through Jesus Christ, made known to all people, with all who come to the manger, rejoice in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. Let us now join together in singing Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Yes, indeed. The Lord be with you. Please join with me in our prayer of the day. Almighty God, 
you wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and yet more wonderfully restored it. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of the one who came to share our humanity, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia in chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Paul writes, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent his Spirit, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer slaves, but God's children. And since you are his children, you have, you are, he has also made you heirs. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much for our special music. Our gospel reading today comes from St. Luke chapter 2, and this is a long reading, so I gotta, I gotta get ready for this one. Here we go. <clears throat> when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
as it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had revealed to him by, it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the, the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that he will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and, the, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then had been a widow for 84, for 84 years. She never left the temple but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying coming up to them at that very moment she gave thanks to god and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of his, of jerusalem when joseph and mary had done everything required by the law of the lord they returned to galilee to their own town of nazareth and the child grew and became strong he was filled with wisdom and the grace of god was on him the gospel of our lord Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this time of worship. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith that you have sown into our hearts and for the people that you have surrounded us with that have helped that faith to nurture and grow. We thank you, Jesus, for coming anew to us each and every day. And like Simeon and Anna, help us to recognize your presence in your midst and as we walk with you, Lord, to serve you and to glorify you until we are all gathered in your heavenly kingdom. In your holy name we pray, amen. Well, when I was in high school, there was a, a group of guys that I hung out with. There was maybe like five or six of us. And we had this group of girls that we also used to hang out with. We were just kind of all friends. and. And we did a lot of stuff together. But one of the things about these girls is that they all love to watch soap operas. And in particular, their favorite soap opera was When the World Turns. However, they said that we couldn't watch it with them because we were too immature to understand the complex relationships that were going on. And while that was true, I still thought it was ridiculous that you would spend a whole hour watching a soap opera when you could go out and play baseball or fish for carp in the Mississippi or something like that. But there was some truth in the name of it. The world does turn. History moves on, and while we want to learn from the past, we don't want to be bound by the past. And the goal for us, as we see in our lesson today, is to recognize God in the present so that we can know how to live for the future. And again, in our gospel reading for today, Joseph and Mary and Simeon and Anna can show us the way. They can show us how to do that, how to recognize Jesus. Well, as we enter into this gospel story, according to the Leviticus 12 and Exodus 13, 40 days after Jesus would have been born, Mary and Joseph would have brought him to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. The scriptures say that every firstborn would be dedicated to the Lord. And what it demonstrates to us right from the get-go about Mary and Joseph 
is they have this incredibly deep love for the Lord. As Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great Shema says, they love the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their strength. And they want to be obedient out of that love to whatever the scriptures teach. And that's so important for us to go forward, is, especially as Lutherans, that we are people of the word, <laughs> that we put not only our trust in what God teaches, but because of our love, we want to be obedient to what the scriptures teach and to live it out as abundantly and graciously as we can each and every day. And that's a wonderful first step as we enter into this, this new year in about a week. Well, when they get to the temple, we learn something else about them. We learn that they are poor. Normally, when a family would go to the temple, they would offer a, a lamb when they would dedicate their firstborn. But in the case of Mary and Joseph, they offer two turtle doves, which would be used by low-income families. But what we also see is that even though Joseph and Mary might be financially poor in the eyes of the world. They were richly blessed because they were filled not only with the Holy Spirit, but they experienced the presence of God each and every day of their lives. Now, when Joseph and Mary and Jesus arrive at the temple, there probably would have been hundreds if not thousands of people but in the midst of the crowd, we're introduced to two people. We're introduced to Simeon, and we're introduced to Anna, both of whom are old. I mean, they might even be considered ancient. I don't know if you realize this, but that when Jesus lived, the average lifespan of somebody was 35 to 36 years of age, which is kind of interesting to think of Jesus. He started his ministry when he was about 33, which would have made him a senior citizen in <laughs> the eyes of the people around him. But Anna is in her late 80s, if not into her early 90s, and Simeon, the, the same. And, but there's something about their faith that we will see that enables them to recognize Jesus when everybody else misses it. What Simeon and Anna also have in common is that they are both looking for consolation. To be consoled is the need or the desire to be comforted after you have lost something precious and dear to you. And so can you think of something that maybe you've experienced, a loss that you've experienced? Someone or something that was precious and dear to you? Thank you, Isaac. My grandma. Your grandma, right? Yep, and our grandparents have just a really special place Yep, in our lives. For my kids, their favorite person is their grandma. Yeah, so we can identify. We can all identify with, with Simeon and with Anna. We've all experienced loss. We all long to be comforted. Anna would have been, a, like Mary, a teenager when she was married. And what we learn in the scriptures is that her husband died only seven years after they were married. And what we also learn about her is that after her husband died, there was no family to turn to. And I think sometimes we forget in first century Palestine, there was no safety net. If you didn't have a family that you could turn to, you were destitute, you were on your own. And so we see that, that Anna has no place to turn. And I just can't even imagine what that would have, have been like for her. Secondly, we see how she responds to her loss. In the midst of her sadness and pain, she decides to dedicate her life to the Lord. And the scriptures teach us that for 84 years, she has not only been in the temple, but that she has been worshiping the Lord day in and day out. And through that process of daily worship and opening herself up to God, there is a transformation that we can see that is taking place in her. And over the years, her faith becomes so deep that she's not recognized anymore as a grieving widow. But now the scriptures say that the people around her recognize her as a prophet of one who can speak for God. Simeon's pain and loss go back even farther. 
Although he probably would have been too young to fight, he certainly would have remembered when Pompey, the Roman general, came in and invaded Israel. He also would have remembered stories about how it wasn't enough for simply for Pompey to come in and to invade and to destroy Israel, but he would remember the story of how Pompey, to make a point, walked into the Holy of Holies with his muddy and bloodstained boots to, to defile and to desecrate everything that the people of Israel hold or held most sacred. And every day since then, it was as if the boot of the Roman Empire was upon their neck. And so Simeon longed for the day when the Lord would send the Messiah, when the Lord would send the Messiah to not only set them free, but to restore the nation of Israel. And like Anna, he too responded to his pain and his grief, not by giving up or becoming jaded, but he responded out of his pain and his grief to the Lord by offering himself up and worshiping day in and day out. As we mentioned, there are a lot of people who still long for the good old days and what was, and a lot of people who want to be consoled. A number of years ago, I was talking with a church member who was lamenting the good old days when the pews in the church were filled and the Sunday school was overflowing with children. We can sometimes long for those days too, can't we? <laughs> It was kind of unsettling for me not too long ago. The ELCA did an internal study. And before the pandemic, on a typical Sunday, there would be about a million Lutheran Christians that would worship in church. It, but it was estimated that in the next 20 to 30 years, that number will decline to 50,000. Think about that. That's a 95% decline. And the woman that I was talking to could see this happening years earlier in her inner city church. She said that back in the 50s and 60s, there were over 4,000 people who worshiped on a Sunday morning. And there was almost 1,000 children that were in the Sunday school. But when I arrived, there was only 65 people left. And there was no children. She almost had tears in her eyes. But what struck me was that she was not only sad and in pain, but over the years her pain gave way to anger, as it always does when it's left unchecked. And in her anger, she rattled off a litany of people and things that she thought were responsible for the decline. The only person that she left off the list was herself, as we often do. She felt victimized. But she's not alone. Theologian Richard Rohr writes that we now live in a society of victimhood, looking for someone or some group to blame for all of our problems, whether it has to do with our society, our churches, and our personal lives. But such a mindset can blind us to the presence of Jesus in our midst. Of course, no one will readily admit that they're a victim, but at a very deep level, we can all be drawn to the power that it yields. You see, if I'm a victim, then I can claim the moral high ground for myself. Because you and your group hurt me, because you and your group offended me, because you or your group disrespected me, I now have <clears throat> the right to think or say or to do whatever I want, and you have no right to question me. You know why? Because I'm the victim. As Richard Rohr writes, by playing the victim, you don't have to straighten up, grow up. You don't have to let go. You don't have to forgive. You don't have to surrender. You don't even have to get the log out of your own eye. At the end of the day, Rohr writes, it's the ultimate form of pride. However, when we look to the life of Joseph and Mary, when we look to the life of Simeon and Anna, the one thing that we do not see is an attitude or a belief of victimhood. Mary and Joseph didn't feel as though they were victims, even though they lived under a corrupt system. 
Anna does not see herself as a victim because life had dealt her a, a cruel hand. And Simeon isn't pointing a finger and trying to bring back the good old days. What we can see in all of them is that they live in to what the writer of Hebrews teaches, and they understand that faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Every day, they worship the Lord by offering their very lives. Every day, they walked by faith with the goal of doing what is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Every day, they fixed their eyes on the Lord and thought deeply about how they could live lives of gratitude, not focusing on what they lost, but what they had. And every day, they waited and waited and waited not realizing that in their waiting that God was preparing them to be able to hear and to understand, to see and perceive the Lord that was in their midst. And so as we enter into this new year, we're invited to come before the throne of grace that the writer of Hebrews also offers and to lay down those things that are burdening us, that are holding us back, that might be blinding us to see the good and the wonderful things that God wants to do in our lives and in our churches. And so one of the questions that I'm wrestling with as I enter into this new year is what am I still clinging to from the past that I need to let go of? As Christians, we always want to travel light. What kind of pain and anger am I still hanging on to do today? What can I lay at the foot of Jesus and allow him to bring me the healing that I need? Again, as we enter into this new year, as we enter into this time of worship, just as Jesus was present in the temple so many years ago, the Christ child has come to us again this Christmas, that Jesus is present with us here today. And as Simeon held that child and looked into his eyes, he realized that as long as he held on to Jesus, as long as it, he had Jesus, that there was still a future that was filled with hope, that he didn't have to try to live into the past, that he didn't have to try to point fingers, but just to let his faith rest in Jesus Christ and to let his kingdom come in and through us. Amen. Please join with me in singing our hymn of the day, which is, Lo, how a rose air blooming. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
joining our vo voices with the song of the angels, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. Night and day, all creation praises you, O God. Strengthen your church across nations, denominations, and traditions. Fill us with wisdom and unify our proclamation of your forgiveness and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The nations are upheld by your hand, O God. Cause righteousness and praise to spring forth, inspiring leaders to serve with compassion and integrity. Send your spirit of discernment upon legislators grappling with complex decisions for the sake of the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Send the spirit of your Son into our hearts, O God. Come quickly to the hearts that race with fear, hearts that break with grief, hearts that long for wholeness, especially those whom we now name before you. Reveal your power to heal and to save. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us depart in peace, O God, according to your word. We give you thanks, Lord, for those that you have put on our path to help us on our journey who are no longer here with us, those whom we now grieve and lift up to you. Prepare our salvation in the light of all your witnesses of every time and place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, come quickly to us with grace upon grace as we lift these and all of our prayers to you in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now join together in singing our offertory song, Let Our Gladness Have No End. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Just have a few announcements uh, to share with you. Uh, good news, uh, there's a snowstorm, I guess, on the way for Wednesday, so what a wonderful way to bring in the, the new year. Uh, also, we're gonna be sending out a mailing to all of the confirmation families, so we're gonna get that out this week, so you can kind of look for that in the mail. We'll also have some information on the website and on Facebook, but in particular, look for that mailing. And then coming up on Friday, January 15th from noon to six, uh, there'll be a blood drive here at Zion, and I know that there is always a need for that. So however you can uh, support uh, that ministry, uh, please encourage you to do that. And you can see where you can call if you'd like to give blood that day. So now let us receive the blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now join together in singing our ascending hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. <laughs> 